Good evening, everyone. My name is Douglas Sprang, and I lead the Energy and Environment Series for the MIT Club of Northern California. Tonight's event is the fourth of our 2021-22 season, featuring top speakers in our fields of interest, such as renewable energy, electric vehicles, sustainability, and climate change. Tonight's speakers are two MIT professors, Jacopo Bongiorno and John Lino and senior researcher John Parsons of the MIT Sloan School. We're also pleased to have as tonight's moderator, Steve Jordan, a longtime member of our energy and environment team who is president of the Purissima Hills Water District and a board member of the Bay Area Water Conservation and Supply Agency. And he just showed up with the uh, Hetch Hetchy in the background. Steve will introduce our three speakers as they appear in their shared presentation and will lead the Q&A session, which will also include questions from online registration. We've also enabled live Q&A, and I'll do my best to get as many of these questions to Steve as I can, although we probably won't get to all of them. By the way, for best viewing experience, we recommend you watch this event in gallery mode. Now I'll be back at the end to close things out, but now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Steve Jordan. Take it away, Steve. Thank you, Doug. It's great to be here. Uh, here we go again with the second uh, multi-year drought in eight years. This one looks like it'll be a three-year drought also, which is what the length of the last one was. Um, and as many of you may know, our water system is highly dependent upon the winter precipitation, and it is highly variable. Um, and because of that, California is destined to repeat similar droughts uh, going forward. So this is not the last time we will see this. Um, when uh, Doug and I were first learned about this uh, Diablo Canyon desal project, what captured my attention with the proposal was its massive size uh, in terms of how much water it could produce and the fact that it, it produces what could be a consistent water supply, which is in stark contrast to the main way we get water, which is a big reservoir projects scattered throughout the states, the state. Um, the middle range capacity proposed is about half of the average water provided by the, the state water project, which runs virtually the entire length of, of the state. Um, the state water project can vary from 200,000 acre feet to 4 million acre feet in a year, each year, depending upon how much precipitation occurred. Um, so this uh, proposal is similar also in yield to what is the uh, planned 14,000 acre sites reservoir is what it's called uh, to be constructed by 2030. So it takes a while, it will cost $5 billion and only then we'll begin collecting excess water. Um, there's a key difference versus uh, existing reservoir projects or the future ones, the proposed facility is net new water and that could be consistently available every year. Uh, and that's that's really what's exciting and what got our attention. So with that as a background, I'd like to uh, introduce Professor Jacobo Buongiorno, who is the TEPCO Professor of Nuclear Science and Engineering at MIT and the Director of Science and Technology at the MIT Nuclear Reactor Laboratory. He teaches both graduate and undergraduate courses in thermofluids engineering, nuclear reac reactor engineering, and has published 90 journal articles in the area of safe design, reactor design, two-phase flow and heat transfer, nanofluid technology. I guess my first question, Jacobo, is what, what got you interested in this Diablo slash desal idea? Well, uh, at the very onset of this study, we did some back of the envelope calculations about the amount of uh, fresh water that could be produced through desalination using the power output of Diablo Canyon. And just like uh, you, you and Doug um, hinted in your introduction, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, amount was so impressive that really motivated us to to, to start a more formal study and look into this in, in greater details. And then as you will see when I present it, 
uh, or we will present it, uh, there is more to, 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 to fresh water. We also look at electricity, hydrogen, and also polygeneration, but definitely water was the starting point. So that's, that's a good hook here in the conversation. Yeah, that, that's great. And, and so um, Jacobo has won several awards at MIT, uh, teaching outstanding teacher, McVicker faculty fellowship, and uh, several others that uh, I won't I won't go through now. But he's also on the Secretary of Energy Advisory Board, um, and as a fellow of the American Nuclear Society, which included um, service on its special committee on Fukushima in 2011 and 12. So, um, so I, I suspect that that may come up during the course of this. Now, Jacobo, we also understand you're an avid triathlete. Uh, would would you run a triathlon at Di Diablo Canyon once it's recommissioned? Absolutely, I would. And uh, th <laughs> thanks th thanks to the power plant, the water there is a little bit warmer than, than along the California coast. So I might be able to do the swim without a wetsuit. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Well, without any, any further ado, uh, why don't you go ahead and, and start the presentation? All right, fantastic. So I'm going to share a screen and you guys are going to be able to see slides. But first, let me thank uh, you, Steve and Doug, for inviting us. Uh, we're always excited to present um, our work, uh, in this case, the findings and, and implications of, of our study. And I also want to thank uh, the MIT alumni that connected for our uh, seminar here. In your honor, I've chosen as a background the uh, Killian Court Dome. Um, and if you look carefully on the ground, there you'll see snow. Now, um, as of a couple of days ago, that was accurate. We actually had snow here in Boston, but today was a um, you know, an early sort of uh, hint of the spring. And so it feels a lot more like uh, uh, California at the moment. All right, so let me let me jump here. I hope everybody can see the, the slides and hear me clearly. Uh, Steve, just uh, please confirm you can see the slide. Yes. Fantastic. So, yes, looks good. Uh, so this is a, um, it was actually a joint uh, MIT Stanford study, uh, which ran for about a year and a half. And uh, we completed the study in uh, last fall and presented uh, or officially sort of uh, uh, released the report in, in November. The title of the study is shown here. So it's an assessment of the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant for zero carbon electricity desalination and hydrogen production. So as I already mentioned, it's desalination is certainly a big, big part of it, but it's not the whole. So um, the, the presentation has different uh, sections. I'm gonna start by um, providing a little bit of information on background and motivation, why we did the study. Uh, I'll summarize up front also the, uh, the scope, what the study entailed as well as the uh, uh, summary findings. And then we'll drill down a little bit, uh, a little bit deeper. The, I'll have an additional section, uh, a little bit of a tutorial on, on nuclear power plants with, with specific reference to, to Diablo to sort of uh, uh, explain a little bit better what the uh, opportunities and also challenges associated with the license extension of Diablo are. And, uh, and, then we'll, and then we'll get to the end of the, uh, um, of the presentation with the Q&A. But so first things first, uh, you, you may be familiar with this, but let's just sort of recap why uh, this is a, uh, you know, a, a question. What, what, what is the question of Diablo Canyon uh, relicensing? So back in January 2018, the CPUC approved a settlement to permanently shut down Diablo Canyon when the current federal license uh, uh, for the two units expires. And the unit one, it's two reactors at Diablo Canyon. The first reactor license will expire in 2024, the second in 2025. Um, at the moment, Diablo uh, provides about 8% of Californians in-state electricity production. That translates to roughly 15% of its carbon-free electricity uh, production in the state. Now, in its decision, the CPUC found that the plan was not cost effective to continue in operation, that it was not needed for system reliability, and that its value for reducing greenhouse gas emissions was unclear. So that was 2018. Now, fast forward uh, three and a half years, four years, to where we are now. Uh, many things have happened, and some of the assumptions that were made back then um, have changed. And so uh, that's really what has motivated us to take a fresh look at the value of, of Diablo Canyon. So... Let me spend a couple of minutes explaining what we think has, has changed that, that makes it a compelling question now to, to see if Diablo Canyon should or should not be relicensed. So first and foremost, California has set some very aggressive, uh, I should say appropriately aggressive targets for decarbonization of its uh, power sector and, and broader economy. And these are 
um, embodied in, uh, in Senate Bill 100 and Executive Order B5518. Um, there have been a variety of studies, some in fact, at MIT and, and Stanford in other groups uh, uh, than the, the one that did this study, affirming the need for firm, which means dispatchable, controllable, uh, clean, which means zero carbon energy to decarbonize the grid. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. What is the value of an energy source like nuclear, which is firm and carbon free or low carbon um, in, in, the, in, in the electricity system? of California and, and more broadly. Um, there have also been reliability challenges uh, on the, in the electric grid in California in 2020, in particular with, with some blackouts and uh, likely ongoing and in the future uh, even more as more variability both in, in demand as well as generation um, uh, grows in the system. Uh, 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 both Steve and Doug already mentioned the severe drought that, that the state has been experiencing uh, with an associated need for uh, reducing water consumption as well as increasing uh, water supplies. There is also a desire to set aside a public land for, for future conservation, um, and that is embodied at the federal level uh, by the so-called uh, Executive Order 30 by 30. And then last but not least, I'll spend a few minutes later in the presentation um, explaining how the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has completed a, uh, a decade-long uh, review of the seismic hazards at Diablo Canyon that evaluation has had a very positive outcome, and therefore that has also changed some of the assumptions that were made back in 2018. So once again, in aggregates, uh, these changes have, have, have stimulated us to take a fresh look at, uh, at the value of Diablo Canyon in addressing some of these challenges that California is facing. Um, now, an important note here, the, the study was funded uh, entirely from internal university sources and philanthropic donations. We did not seek or accept any money from, from industry. This was important for us. We wanted to make sure that we, we maintain credibility and sort of arm's length from any vested interest uh, in the state and elsewhere. Okay, um, you already seen three members of the team, John Lehner, John Parsons, and myself, but this was a broader effort, as I mentioned, including folks at Stanford University. And in particular, I want to acknowledge Professor Sally Benson, um, Professor of Energy Resources Engineering. She was the PI on the, on the Stanford side, uh, leading the work on, uh, um, on uh, the um, electricity generation or the value of Diablo in the, in the electricity system at uh, California, working with Sally, uh, EJ, uh, EJ Bake, uh, who is a very, very capable uh, PhD candidate, pretty close to actually getting, getting her degree. And she, she was the person who actually ran the analysis and the simulations and the modeling that we'll present later on. And on the MIT side, we also had uh, two graduate students, Andrew Boma and Quanto Wei, who worked primarily with uh, Professor Leonard on the water desalination questions. And then you will see that we also looked at a scenario in which uh, part or all of the uh, capacity or power output of Diablo Canyon um, is devoted to uh, production of hydrogen. This is primarily to help with the uh, uh, decarbonization uh, of the uh, transportation sector in California. And that part of the, uh, of the study was, uh, was, was uh, led by Justin Auburn, who is a senior consultant at uh, Lucid Catalyst. Okay, so first a word about the scope of the study. And then on the next slide, I'll, I'll sort of summarize what the findings are. So we essentially looked at four scenarios. You can think about these as four different products that you could get out of uh, Diablo Canyon or four if you look at it just from an economic point of view, four revenue streams. The first scenario is sort of business as usual. So Diablo Canyon continues to be essentially just a power generator and its power output goes to the, uh, goes, goes to the grid. And, and so a lot of the analysis that we did was about that. Um, and then the question there is, okay, what's the value of the, of the plant in terms of uh, reducing um, uh, carbon emissions, maintaining reliability, stability on the grid, and, and also perhaps saving, saving some money. And so in a few minutes, you'll, you'll hear what, uh, you know, what our analysis uh, basically uh, suggest. The second scenario is one in which uh, either part of all of the power output of Diablo Canyon are used for desalinating water. And the point here is that you would have a co-located um, a, a co-located uh, desalination plant, co-located at the Diablo Canyon site. I'm sorry, I'm still on the previous slide. And as we will explain, these entail some uh, synergies that basically make the fresh water produced by that, by that plant uh, cheaper than fresh water that would be desalinated or, or seawater that would be desalinated producing fresh water elsewhere in the state. 
Um, the third scenario is hydrogen, and I already mentioned this. If you want to decarbonize the transportation sector, you essentially have two options. You either go with electric vehicles, in which case uh, you're going to need more electric capacity, more power capacity on your grid, uh, or you go with the fuel cell vehicles. And fuel cell vehicles use hydrogen. Hydrogen is not a primary energy source. It has to be generated uh, from a primary energy source. And a good way to do so is to basically uh, uh, electrolyze water, to crack the molecule of water, H2O, and extract hydrogen that way. Well, that requires uh, electricity input. And if that electricity input is carbon-free, as, as, as would be the case for Diablo Canyon, then your hydrogen is also carbon-free. So we look, at that, uh, we look at that scenario as well. And once again, co-located plant with, uh, with uh, Diablo Canyon. And then the fourth is perhaps the most interesting, and uh, maybe also the most uh, futuristic longer term is what we call polygeneration. So what if uh, you co-locate with Diablo Canyon, not uh, a, a desalination plant and a hydrogen plant, and at any given time, uh, you sort of direct uh, a share of the power output to either desalination, hydrogen, or a little bit of both, and also the grid. And so you basically triage your power output at any given time throughout the year to really maximize the value of that energy uh, at, that particular, at that particular time. So as I said, in a, on the next slide, I'll tell you what the findings are for this. But the, uh, what's important to understand here is that in all these cases, of course, there are costs associated with uh, uh, realizing those scenarios. And, and some of the costs are quite clearly associated with the deployment of new facilities. So for example, if you want to desalinate water, you want to co-locate a plant there, well, you're going to have to Construct it, so that's that's a big expense, and we we certainly accounted for those expenses there. There are some operating costs associated with running a desalination plant or a hydrogen plant or a polygeneration facility, and we accounted for that. But there are also some uh, important costs associated with relicensing and then operating beyond 2035, uh, excuse me, 2025, the uh, the Diablo Canyon plants and. Uh, some of the costs are obvious. You're going to need to continue to pay for the fuel that is that is consumed with the plant and also operating costs. That's primarily um, operators, the workforce, et cetera. But there are also some additional capital costs. And the most important of which is a replacement of the existing intake because California has some fairly strict uh, uh, legal requirements or regulations for protection of marine life. And the current once through uh, uh, cooling system at Diablo Canyon is not in uh, in, uh, in compliance with those regulations. So that's an important capital cost. And we spent a significant amount of time, and we'll tell you a little bit more later in the presentation, in, in trying to understand what new uh, intake technology would, would actually satisfy the regulations in California and what the cost associated with that new intake was. So for all the calculations that we're going to show you, all these costs were, were, were included. That's, that's an important point I want to make. So we tried to be as comprehensive as possible. All right, so finally, let's go to the, to the findings. And I'm gonna start with electricity. So if you were to extend the license of Diablo Canyon by only 10 years, from 2025 to 2035, then our modeling of the California power grid shows that uh, continuing to operate uh, Diablo for 10 years would basically reduce the California power sector emissions by more than 10% annually with respect to 2017 levels. And in doing so, it would reduce reliance on gas. And what we're assuming here is that uh, that new gas capacity, which would be required if, uh, if Diablo Canyon goes down, it's either in state, which is unlikely because the state has some, some clear plans that uh, Diablo should be replaced with, uh, with renewables, or most likely this would be uh, uh, electricity imports from neighboring states, which produce that electricity from coal and, and, uh, and natural gas. Um, and in, in doing so, in, in continue to operate in Diablo, uh, we estimate that there would be a saving of uh, a total saving of about two, $6 billion in, in power systems, which primarily come from the reduced need for building new capacity in either solar and wind, particularly solar, or natural gas for backing up uh, the, uh, the renewables or storage batteries for ensuring that the intermittency of renewables can be, uh, can be, uh, can be accommodated. Again, more, more details about this later on, but these are sort of the summary, uh, the summary findings. And, and needless to say, a, uh, a, a dispatchable um, uh, power generator such as uh, Diablo Canyon would bolster the system ability to mitigate uh, brownouts and blackouts, as 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 actually has been demonstrated empirically during the uh, during the 2020 brownouts. Diablo Canyon was was one of the few reliable power generators that went through this. 
Um, it's even more interesting if you assume that the license extension goes an additional 10 years. So instead of uh, 2035, now go to 2045. And in this case, the savings um, associated with, with extending the license of Diablo Canyon become even bigger, which makes sense because when you're, it, it's really during that second decade that the power, uh, that, that the electric grid in California will, will drive towards deep decarbonization. And in those scenarios, it's pretty clear from our modeling and other, other modeling that has been done for other regions of the United States and uh, by, by other organizations that in those deeply decarbonized scenarios, the value of a carbon-free or low-carbon dispatchable asset like a nuclear power plant becomes even, even higher. And so in those scenarios, uh, the savings could be up to $21 billion in power system cost. And the associated uh, uh, reduce capacity of solar that would need to be deployed is equivalent to 90,000 acres of land. And just to put things in perspective, I think we have this in the in, in a in a later slide. But this you'll see 90,000 acres is a lot of land. It's roughly the same size as the San Francisco Peninsula. Um, desalination again, more detail later on. But we look at several different sizes and and therefore water capacity uh, of, uh, of a co-located desalination plant. In all cases, the technology that we assume is a reverse osmosis, which essentially requires only as input, well, water from the sea, obviously, that's what you're trying to desalinate, and then electricity, which in this case would come directly from Diablo Canyon. And because the, the desalination plant and Diablo Canyon would share the same intake, that new intake that Diablo Canyon will require anyway. And under most scenarios, it would also share, excuse me, they would also share the outfall and other sort of uh, uh, synergistic structures at the site. The, uh, as you will see in details, the cost of the water coming out of this desalination plant is roughly half of what you get from a generic desalination plant that would draw electricity from the grid, generic electricity from the grid. Um, the scenario on hydrogen is, was also quite interesting. Uh, we assumed that uh, all the power output uh, from uh, Diablo Canyon could be um, directed to electrolyzers, which would be co-located. It would be deployed there at the site. And in that case, uh, that the figure is not shown here, but you'll see later, uh, the capacity or the uh, uh, hydrogen output is of the order of, I think, 150 or 130,000 tons of hydrogen per year, and that amounts to uh, something like 15 or 20% of the projected hydrogen uh, demand for California, again, for the transportation for the transportation sector. And here too, the cost of that hydrogen would be a fraction of what you would get from generic electricity from the grid, or even dedicated facilities based on solar, solar and wind, plus um, uh, 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 storage for firming out that capacity. Last but not least, polygeneration. In that case, as I said, you triage sort of the uh, the power output to the different uh, uh, to the different uh, products at any given time. And uh, the figure of merit that we use here is say we, we try to quantify or monetize, if you wish, the value of a uh, single megawatt hour of electricity generated by by Diablo. And uh, it's it's not surprising that because of the fluctuations in demand and therefore the fluctuation in prices of these three different commodities, electricity, uh, water, and hydrogen, if you have the ability to switch from one to another at any given time throughout the year, then the value of the power output of Diablo Canyon can be quite substantially enhanced. And, and what we quantify was about 50%. 50% higher. So in, in, in over, overall, these conclusions are sufficiently uh, positive and, and, and robust. We think all our analyses have been uh, validated with the sensitivity analysis. So we feel good. We feel that these are, these are solid conclusions. Uh, but by no means this is intended to be the definitive word on any of these questions. And so if, if uh, uh, you know, stakeholders in California decide that it's a good idea to seriously reconsider the question of Diablo Canyon and whether it should be relicensed or not, uh, this, this we feel that constitutes a, a good basis for that uh, for that discussion. The value to us of Diablo Canyon going forward is pretty clear. So let me switch gear a little bit, and I'm going to spend a few more minutes before passing the torch to uh, my colleague, Professor John Liener, for the water desalination uh, uh, discussion. I, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, nuclear power in general and these some specific considerations for Diablo that always come up uh, when we when we give these you know these presentations and I'm sure are on people's on people's mind 
So first, um, in very generic terms, a, a nuclear power plant is essentially is a heat source. Uh, the heat comes from a nuclear reaction, which we call fission. And I, I'm not going to go into the details, but a very simple schematic of the uh, of, of, of a nuclear power plant of the type that is used at uh, Diablo Canyon is shown here. So if you can see my cursor, there is a, a the reactor itself within this reactor vessel, which is a steel container. Um, uh, you have the, uh, the what we call the reactor core. That's where the fuel is. That's uranium, and it's within that fuel that you have the fusion reaction. So that's your sort of your heat source. And then, in in this uh, design, which is called the pressurized water reactor, you have highly pressurized water which is circulated through the core it picks up the energy and then it releases that energy or transfers that energy to a secondary loop which is again water but at a lower pressure and so that water is now allowed to boil in this glorified heat exchanger which we call a steam generator and so you generate ultimately generate steam that steam blows through a turbine the turbine is connected to a generator that's how you get electricity out to the grid. And then to close the cycle, uh, the steam at the outlet of the turbine, which is a low pressure and low temperature, is condensed in a dedicated heat exchanger, which we call, uh, with a great leap of creativity, the condenser. And then that water, that feed water, is pumped back to the steam generator. So that's how Diablo Canyon works. In the case of Diablo Canyon, this last loop that you see here that ensures that that cooling within the condenser occurs efficiently um, it's based on seawater. So this, this final, again, if you're looking at my cursor, this final loop down here is seawater. So the first thing that people who are not knowledgeable or not, not familiar with, with nuclear power plants is say, well, you're using seawater in a nuclear power plant. Does that mean that the water comes out radioactive? No, because as you can see here, there are you know three loops basically in between, or there are two loops in between the source of radioactivity, which is the, which is the core down here and the ocean down here. So that water... It goes through the condenser, remains nice and clean. Now, a lot of the interesting and I should say attractive characteristics of nuclear really stem from basic, from basic physics. So let me compare nuclear to other uh, more traditional energy sources. And the first is coal. And so, of course, we know in a coal fire plant, we're uh, basically realizing a combustion, a chemical reaction. So you got a, an atom of carbon plus oxygen. You get, unfortunately, CO2, which is the bad news. And you get some energy. Let's call it one unit of energy. In a, in a gas fire plant, it's very similar, except the molecule you start with is methane, CH4. You still get the, um, the uh, CO2, which is bad, and then you get a little bit more energy. In a nuclear reactor, the fission reaction is a fundamentally different reaction. It's not chemical, it's nuclear. And you're, bond, you're, you're breaking bonds at the nuclear scale, which are much stronger. And therefore, when you do that, the amount of energy that is liberated is much, much larger. So the fission reaction is the absorption of the neutron by a nucleus of uranium-235, typically. You get a couple of fission fragments. That's very bad news because those are radioactive. And that's basically what, what creates all these sort of safety uh, concerns about nuclear is this radioactive uh, uh, fission uh, fission fragments, you get a couple of extra neutrons, which are very important because they allow you to maintain a chain reaction. And then look at this, 50 million units of energy. So on a per uh, reaction basis, uh, a uh, nuclear fission liberates uh, millions of times more energy than, than a combustion. So what are the practical implications of this? So take a power plant, a thousand megawatt power plant, that's roughly enough electricity to serve the needs of three quarter of a million homes. If you were to power that, uh, that plant with coal, you would need roughly 7,000 tons per day of coal. So if you've ever visited or, or driven next to a coal fire plant, you'd notice that there is a big mountain of, of coal sitting outside. And typically there is a railway that brings in um, loads of coal almost on a daily basis because the plant requires that amount of uh, fuel on a continuous basis. Natural gas is very similar, except it's a gas, so it requires a pipeline. And in this case, it will require 64 cubic meters per second of gas. That's an enormous amount of gas. Now, the implication is that these plants have to continuously be refueled. And if your fuel supply is impacted or disrupted for whatever reason, for example, up here in the Northeast, sometimes we got polar vortex, then your power plants are down. Very different story with a nuclear power plant because the amount of fuel that is required to power that 1,000 megawatt plant, again, three quarter of a million homes, would be about 300 kilograms per day of natural uranium. 300 kilograms of uranium. Uranium is a dense material, probably sit 
on, on my table. It's a very, very small amount. The implication of this is that they are not, they don't need a re continuous refueling. And in fact, they can run for say six, uh, a year and a half to two years without refueling. At the end of that period, you need to shut down, open the reactor, put in the new fuel and off you go again. So it's a very different mode of, of, of operation. And it's why nuclear basically is, is uh, always being operated always on. Now, the other thing that is interesting about nuclear is because of that, um, of, of that basic physics, that high energy density, also the land that is, uh, that is needed for producing a certain amount of power tends to be very small. I already mentioned about the, what we call capacity factor, which is basically the availability of the plant. It's all, it can be always on if you want it always on. But it also, it's pretty small for the amount of power that you get. So the little image that you see here is a uh, four reactor power plant in, I think this is in France here, it generates enough power for a city of 3.5 million people. And it sits on a little bit over a square, a square mile. And so you can do the math there and that's about 22, 2300 megawatt per, per square kilometer. And needless to say, of course, renewables, which are also carbon free and, and they're great. And you know, we, need, we need to uh, expand our capacity of solar and wind, but they certainly have uh, some downsides. The first is that it's in inherently intermittent. I mean, obviously you get sunshine and, and wind whenever mother nature gives it to you. But the other thing is that they're not very dense uh, energy sources. And so you can see here what you can get at most for a solar field is about six megawatt per square kilometer. So about a factor of, uh, almost a factor of a thousand small. And for wind, it's even worse, except that for wind, of course, all these landing between the wind turbines can be used uh, for other purposes. So again, very, very high density. Well, it's not all uh, rosy uh, news, obviously, for nuclear. But the, the one, one uh, thing that concerns everybody is, of course, nu nuclear waste. And this is, a, you will recognize, this is a picture of, uh, of Diablo Canyon. And uh, nuclear waste storage area at Diablo Canyon is a circle here in, in yellow. Now, what we call nuclear waste in a power plant is really the spent fuel that comes out of the reactor that I showed you a couple of slides ago. So at the end of that year and a half or two years, uh, some of those fuel assemblies with the uranium come out, they're highly radioactive. They stay within a pool of water for a couple of years, after which they are um, they're transferred into, a, into dry casks. And dry casks are shown here. These are basically cylindrical containers. They're made of steel and, they're, and, they're, and they have a concrete um, outer layer, primarily for radiation protection. And they are cooled naturally by, by the atmosphere. So this does not require any fan, any pump, no, no active system, no energized system. They just sit out there. They're pretty stable. Uh, they're safe. They're even cheap to maintain. But ultimately, these materials got to go somewhere. So uh, this is not a crisis. It's not an emergency, certainly at, uh, at the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant. This is an aerial view of the, uh, of the uh, waste storage facility or area at Diablo Canyon. And uh, each of these little uh, uh, round object that you see here is one, one such dry cask. So you see that over a period of 35 years, they've accumulated, I think this is roughly 60 dry casks. That's all there is, by the way, when people say, you know, wait, uh, nuclear waste and all that, this is all that uh, Diablo Canyon has, has produced over the, past, uh, over the past 35 years. And you can see here that there is more than enough room to uh, accumulate for probably over another 35 years, certainly another 10 or 20 years, which is the period for the license extension. So eventually this material has to go to a national repository. At the moment, unfortunately, the US does not have a national repository, uh, but uh, whether Diablo Canyon is shut down or not, these dry, cask are gonna, these dry casks for nuclear waste are gonna be at that site until the US comes up with a national repository. The second question, and then I and then I'll uh, you know I'll, I'll pass the torch to to, to John is uh, is seismic. Everybody knows California is a very seismic area. Uh, Diablo Canyon is is right there on the coast. And uh, it, the first point that, that that we should make is that it was designed to be there. In other words, it was designed to be seismically very robust. However, um, uh, uh, concerns about uh, uh, seismic performance of Diablo and frankly every other nuclear power plant in the United States were heightened in 2011 after the Fukushima accident. The NRC launched at that time a review of Diablo as well as every other nuclear power plant in the United States um, in, in terms of their ability to withstand external events. And that's not just earthquakes, by the way, but tsunami, floods, tornadoes, wildfires, hurricanes, uh, even terrorist attacks, et cetera. And, uh, 
using the state-of-the-art seismic methodologies, the Abel Canyon was subject to a very lengthy series of new evaluations that were both generic, fleet-wide, as well as specific. Um, specific means, for example, looking at the various faults that exist in the proximity of the Abel Canyon. And the unanimous, uh, after nine years of assessment, the unanimous um, uh, conclusion by the NRC and a couple of other committees, including one that was appointed by the uh, um, by the state of California, uh, the conclusion is that Diablo Canyon is a seismically safe uh, facility. In other words, they can withstand the, the kind of earthquakes that you could see at that particular at that particular location. In addition to that, Diablo, like once again all other nuclear plants in the United States, after Fukushima has been retrofitted with some special equipment and procedures that are known as flex. And flex is meant to ensure that you have that you maintain reliable cooling of your reactor core and your spent fuel pool within the building um, under a hypothetical scenario where basically all your other safety systems have been disabled, uh, for example, by, I don't know, tornadoes, wildfire, earthquakes, and whatever. And last but not least, the, less, the last level of protection is oversight. Uh, Diablo and, and, and all the plants here in the US are subject to continuous monitoring. And uh, the last time I checked, uh, Diablo was in so-called column one of the NRC, which means you know a good citizen of the nuclear fleet here in the United States. So let me stop there. And uh, Steve, if you want to introduce um, uh, <laughs> Professor Liener, this would be a good time. Thank you, uh, Giacobo. Actually, it's, um, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Parsons now, and then, uh, and then we'll go to uh, Professor Leonard uh, last, but uh, Professor Parsons is a senior lecturer at the Sloan School of Management. He focuses on valuation and financing of investments in energy markets and and the, the problems and the task of decarbonization. So it's this seems appropriate. He's the associate director at MIT's Center for Energy and Environmental Policy Research now and uh, was co-director of the MIT study on the future of nuclear energy in a carbon constrained world. Uh, he's actually also been involved in FERC, which is uh, the US Energy Federal Energy Regulation Regulatory Commission, which people in the water business fondly know as the agency they deal with for every dam. Um, so now, Dr. Parsons, I understand you were the son of a US Navy officer, yet you grew up in the Central Valley, far from NEC. How can can you explain how that happened and how how you got to Slovakia from there? Yes, well, the, the US Navy does have planes and they park them in the middle of the desert between routes out into the Pacific. So somebody has to, my father was an engineer, a civil engineer. And so somebody has to arrange the uh, airfields and such. So it was a wonderful place to grow up. It uh, also was a, the place that I, I learned to ski in the Sierra Nevadas and uh, from the Sierra Nevadas many, many, many years later, I uh, took a research visit to uh, what was then East Berlin to take a peek at uh, what socialism was all about back in the old days and uh, was invited by a crowd of people that I met over the weeks there to go to the Tatra Mountains in Slovakia. It was a great place to go skiing wow. and I'm still in avid skier any any chance I get any place I can well that's great well well thank you for explaining that and uh, let's uh, go ahead and see what uh, what uh, you have to say about the energy and uh, decarbonization great thanks yes I'm going to talk about that uh, the first issue that uh, Jacopo mentioned uh, the use of Diablo Canyon for the electricity market and for carbon reductions and uh, I'm presenting here, uh, I worked on the economics, but we, uh, as Jacopo mentioned, we had our colleagues at Stanford, and in particular, this graduate student, EJ Bike, and she put together this great modeling exercise where uh, she was modeling the entire California system, including imports, and how would the California system achieve its uh, decarbonization? in an economical fashion, uh, going out to 2030, going out to 2040, going out to 2050. Um, and so that's what the results of this exercise that I'm talking about are. Different combinations of wind and solar, utilization of the existing natural gas plants, installation of new batteries and various other 
equipment utilizing the existing hydro? How could you achieve these targets and how could you do that economically? So as Jacopo already sort of summarized, if you keep uh, Diablo as an available resource, then one, uh, you make one sort of strategy of investment in all of these resources. But if you decide you're not going to keep Diablo as a resource on the system, you're going to have to make other investments in order to achieve your decarbonization targets. And so this work compares the with and without of having Diablo on the system and uh, what kind of savings do you get. So uh, as is mentioned here, uh, by keeping Diablo on the system, you don't have to run your natural gas plants anywhere near as much. Uh, you can reduce production from the natural gas plants by about 10.2 terawatt hours per year. Uh, and that's the amount of production that you're getting from the oldest peakers and the gas plants that also use once through cooling, which is the reason, one of the reasons why you would be closing Diablo, but you would be keeping open these other plants with the same uh, water problem. So you get a savings from not utilizing those uh, natural gas plants, uh, both and, and you, you get a savings in lower emissions. So in the example going out to 2025, 2030, you avoid seven metric tons of million tons of CO2 a year. Um, that's about an 11% reduction in CO2 from the electricity sector relative to 2017. So you improve California's ability to make its reach its to decrease carbon in the short term. Then if we can go to the next slide, please, Jacopo. And in addition to reducing more uh, CO2, you also have economic savings. So the $2.6 billion in savings as a result of not having to purchase the natural gas, some capacity for other resources doesn't have to be invested in because you've got the existing capacity from Diablo. That's just savings on investments to produce energy. But California also experienced a problem recently with having enough capacity on a few key days back in August 2020. And so we just we didn't do any different analysis of capacity, but we just highlight here that keeping a, a, a asset like Diablo on the system also improves uh, California's security against uh, a dangerous episode when they might not have enough capacity on the system. So those are the results from the short-term analysis, more carbon reduction, some economical savings, and some extra security. Now, if we can turn to the next slide. Heading, looking out further to 2045, California's uh, targets are to completely eliminate emissions from its electricity system. Keeping Diablo Canyon on the grid will, you can get to the same point, you can decrease, uh, eliminate carbon emissions from your system, but you can do it much more economically if you keep Diablo on the system. To do this, as Jacopo said, deep decarbonization, only with renewables forces you to build such a large quantity of renewables because there are a few hours of the year when you won't have enough solar and wind resources simultaneously and building more only gives you a small contribution uh, and you'll have to build a large volume of both uh, and you'll also have to build some batteries, uh, a large volume of batteries. If you use Diablo in, instead of some of that, you can save the state a total of 15 to $16 billion over that time period. So there's an economic savings to arrive at the uh, zero net zero uh, target. But in addition to the economic savings, these uh, tools for achieving net zero really have costs of their own that are not, so to speak, economic costs. So that second bullet up on the slide points out that if you had Diablo on the system, 
you could reduce the amount of uh, solar PV that you'd install, and you would spare 90,000 acres of land as a result of that. And this diagram is the one that uh, Jacopo re referred to earlier. It's a picture of the San Francisco Bay, the San Francisco Peninsula, and the, the red border highlights what would be 90,000 acres. Uh, that's the scale of savings of solar PV. Now, you still have to build a lot of solar PV. This is just the amount that you don't have to build if you keep uh, Diablo on the system. And so go ahead, I think we can go to the next slide, yeah. So those, those are the results about how you achieve your decarbonization. The only other thing I wanna to speak to briefly before we go to the desal is when we did our analysis, we had to make some uh, estimates of what would be the cost of producing electricity at the Diablo Canyon site. And in, as an input into that analysis that you just heard. And when we did that, we came up with a uh, result that it would cost you the, what we call the bus bar cost, the cost of electricity coming out of the Diablo Canyon plant would be about $42, $48 per megawatt hour, um, approximately $43 a megawatt hour. Um, so that's the input to our analysis. There has been in the public conversation in California, other numbers thrown around, which are much higher, and those have been contrasted with ours. In particular, back in 2016, there was a hearing to decide to close uh, for the California Public Utility Commission had to approve the decision to close Diablo Canyon. And when they approved it, they did a uh, hearing and they received testimony. And one of the pieces of testimony was from PG&E, the owner of Diablo Canyon, estimating that the cost of power from Diablo Canyon would be 100 to 102 to $219 a megawatt hour, much larger than what we estimated. So what's the reason for this discrepancy? And there are two big reasons for the discrepancy. One of them is really vital to what we're doing here. We came up with a method, a, a technology that can economically handle the needs for a new intake system. That'll come up in the next se section, you'll hear about it. It costs you about $500 million in our estimate. When that hearing was happening in 2016, an agreement had already been reached to close Diablo, but they had to come up with the numbers to, to justify that. And what they did was basically say, solving this problem. We don't know how we're gonna solve it. There are many ways possibly. And so they estimated uh, various possible costs. For example, one was for it to cost $13 billion or $6 billion. And they took an average of those, which came to something like uh, one point or $2.3 billion. Our estimate is 500 million, and you'll hear about the, the technology in a moment. The other thing that was different is the PG&E estimate was not an estimate of what would be the cost of going forward. It was what would we be charging customers for the power, including the sunk costs that we've already incurred in Diablo Canyon. Those sunk costs are gonna be charged to customers anyway. Um, and so they're not really relevant for deciding what's the economic decision for Diablo Canyon being closed or not. Even if it's closed, those are being charged to California customers. Secondly, there was other testimony by an, an environmental group uh, opposed to Diablo Canyon. They came up with a much lower number than PG&E, but much higher than ours. And the real difference between those two numbers is primarily that they made some assumptions that the cost at Diablo would grow much faster than inflation, whereas ours were based on historical experience and that costs would grow exactly as inflation. So I just wanted to put that on the table. We can talk about it more if people are interested, but we've clearly assessed what's the difference between our cost estimate and these other ones. All right, with that, I think we're gonna turn it over to Professor Leonhard to talk about DSAL. So Steve, I'll give it back to you. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Parsons. So now I'd like to introduce Professor 
John Leinhard, who is the Jamil Professor of Water and Mechanical Systems at MIT and Director of the Jamil Water and Food Systems Lab, JWAFs, I guess. So um, his, he focuses on heat and fluid flow, thermodynamics, desalinization, uh, written more than 300 technical papers, three textbooks, and has 38 uh, US patents. Uh, he coordinates MIT's research in food security and water supply. And I guess I, for, I first want to know what is a food system and how did you become interested in food systems? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, uh, food, food systems refer to all the things that go into producing and providing food. Uh, there's agriculture, but you know, agriculture is accompanied by um, you know, fertilization, irrigation. It's accompanied by the need to store food and preserve it as you ship it to market. It's accompanied by the need to understand how climate is going to impact food crop productivity, uh, particularly warming temperatures and more frequent droughts. And it is the problems that you encounter in distributing food. For example, uh, determining whether your food is uh, contaminated uh, with uh, bacteria or possibly has been adulterated along the way. Uh, it's the problem faced by smallholder farmers in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, in terms of making their crops productive. The important uh, thing that I'd like to leave you with on food systems, Steve, is, is the following. Food systems represent an enormous contributor to the world's greenhouse gas burden. Uh, recent work and published in both Science and Nature says that food systems account for about a third of greenhouse gas emissions. And in fact, one of those papers states that if we were to shut off all of our energy systems today, the emissions from food systems would prevent us from meet, reaching the targets of the Paris Accords. Wow. Well, that is that is something that uh, that uh, many people probably do not understand. But that's that's fantastic. Now, is it is is there a record for the number of MIT degrees in one family? I guess is and, and how close are you getting <laughs> well, to that? Well, thank you. My wife uh, is a PhD in theoretical chemistry. Uh, my son is just about to be a PhD in material science, but he already has his bachelor's in course three. My daughter did her bachelor's in course two and her master's in the media lab. Uh, and I, I don't know if I mentioned to you that my uncle uh, did his degree uh, in uh, mechanical engineering in the late 1940s on the GI Bill. Wow. Yeah. Wow, wow. So we're approaching uh, uh, double digits, I think. <laughs> if you count. I, each, I, I have colleagues ridiculous. who have even more, so I won't. <laughs> that's uh, fantastic. Well. Uh, please go ahead and take us through the rest of this uh, presentation. Absolutely. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, hello to my friends in the audience. Uh, this next section was done in collaboration with my students, Andrew Bauma and Quantum Way. Uh, next slide, please. As folks have described, the intention here is, or the, the, the proposal here, is that we can take some of the water that's being used to cool the nuclear plant and desalinate it to provide fresh water. So if you look at the solid green arrow on the top, that is the seawater intake. It goes through the condensers to cool the steam, as Jacopo described, and a portion of it can be diverted to the desalination plant. The desal plant runs on electricity uh, from the power plant, and you can use that combination of resources on hand to produce fresh water, which can then be distributed inland with a pipeline uh, 30 kilometers or so until you reach one of the California aqueducts, or you could use it locally, perhaps in San Luis Obispo. The uh, desalination plant produces a concentrated brine. It's shown as a dark green arrow, but because the desalination plant, in most scenarios we considered, does not use all of the cooling water, you blend the brine into the cooling water on the way out with the result that the water leaving the plant will not be very salty compared to local ocean water. So it's already been substantially diluted and it mixes offshore. Now you might wonder how hot is the water coming out of the condenser? Um, the water coming into the condenser is typically at about 16 C or if you like 61 Fahrenheit and it's coming out with a 10 Kelvin rise. So uh, maybe 79 degrees Fahrenheit, 26 C, something in that range. Uh, that range of temperature is typical for operation of many desalination plants. Uh, it'll actually help the performance of the plant relative to using colder water. Now, the scenarios we looked at were of different size. Um, we started with one plant that's the same size as the plant in Carlsbad, California. 
that is the largest plant in the Western Hemisphere, but uh, by international standards, it's not all that big. Um, that plant would use a fraction of the condenser water, a fraction of the power of the plant. We then looked at the next size up, which used half of the uh, condenser water into the desalination plant and some of the power of the power plant. We looked at another one that used uh, all of the condenser water as feed to the desal plant uh, and still leaving power to the grid. And finally, we looked at one that used the full power of the plant, a, a truly enormous desalination plant. I'll show you numbers. Of those four designs, the only one that would require an intake in addition to the one that's already there is uh, the fourth option that uses 100% of the nuclear electricity. Next slide, please. This is a schematic diagram that illustrates uh, how the desalination plant works. This is in fact, typical of most desalination plants today. Uh, most plants that are being built run on a process called reverse osmosis. You can see that as SWRO, seawater reverse osmosis. That consists of polymer membranes, which are semi-permeable, water can pass. Uh, salt ions in the water cannot pass, uh, at least they're rejected at say 98, 99% efficiency. Uh, the result is that you separate out a largely pure water stream and then you produce a brine. Now the brine that leaves the desalination plant, uh, the first pass there in red, is actually at high pressure. The water has been pumped up to about 70 atmospheres before it meets the seawater membranes. And the brine leaving is perhaps at 68 atmospheres. So there's a very clever device, the energy recovery device. It can be as simple as a pelt and wheel turbine, uh, which converts that uh, pressure energy or the enthalpy, if you like, into uh, pressurization of the opposing stream, or in some designs, it drives a generator to produce electricity for the pumps. Uh, the best designs, or at least the most efficient designs today, use a rotating machine based on ceramic water bearings that's capable of recovering about 98% of the available pressurization. So that cuts the energy consumption of the big pumps. Uh, now you'll see something here that says second pass BWRO. That's low salinity feed. So you've taken some of the permeate, the pressure water out, and you run it through a second loop at relatively low pressure, you know, maybe 10 atmospheres. Why do you do that? Well, you might do that to remove additional boron from the water. Why do you want to remove boron? Well. If you're growing certain plants with that water, if it's finding its way into your municipal supply and maybe somebody is, uh, is growing fruit trees, then you don't want excessive boron in the water because it's actually not good for agriculture. So you design that in in order to make sure that you've got the right quality of water leaving the plant. There's remineralization at the end to make sure you put back necessary things, uh, particularly calcium and so forth, so it won't corrode pipes on the way downstream. Now the brine that's been depressurized, the red arrow, it shows here going to an outfall. That would in most scenarios just be blended into the cooling water that's leaving the power plant, uh, which if you recall Jacopo's figure is being discharged on the surface out to sea. The water that's leaving the plant today leaves, as I mentioned, about 10 Kelvin hotter than the water uh, locally. It floats on the surface, it disperses and cools. That Thermal plume has been carefully tracked for 20 years since the plant was, well, 40 years since the plant was opened. Uh, a lot is known about it, including uh, that it has very minimal environmental impact locally. Next slide, please. I wanna give you a sense of scale. Uh, people don't necessarily think about uh, flow rates of water. So I put this all in SI units. Uh, as a professor, I'm very fond of metric units. Uh, a cubic meter is the basic standard of volume here. That's a little bigger than a cubic yard, or if you like, it is 265 gallons. And you can see a range of things here. Typical water consumption of a person in California is about 0.3 cubic meters per day or 320, cubic, uh, 320 liters per day. Um, and then we go up to some practical cases here. The ones in red are the scenarios that we studied for Diablo Canyon. So the first red thing you see here, it is option one that we considered. It's the same size as the Carlsbad plant. So it would produce 189,000 cubic meters per day. 
That incidentally is equivalent to something in the range of 8% of San Diego County's water consumption. Um, you can see just below that, the world's largest reverse osmosis plant today is at Sorek in Israel. It's 540. 1,000 cubic meters per day. There are some larger plants around a million cubic meters per day uh, that are currently uh, being developed. Uh, but then let's move on up. Option two is 2.4 million cubic meters per day. So five times the size of the largest current RO plant. And incidentally, twice the uh, pumping capacity of the coastal branch of the California aqueduct to give you a sense of scale here. Option three about doubles that, 4.7 million cubic meters per day. Option four comes in at monstrous size of 15 million cubic meters per day. That's about the same as the Central Valley Project's average annual delivery to farms, to give you again an idea how large these numbers are. Colorado River is a little further up the, risk, uh, the list. It's about three times option four in size. Uh, Colorado River is not a big river. Uh, if you come to some bigger rivers, the Mississippi and the Amazon are listed down below. Uh, next slide, please. So to continue contextualizing the potential value of, or the potential magnitude, I should say, of the water we're producing, uh, I've got three charts, uh, two charts on the right. Uh, the upper chart, now we're switching units to acre feet per year. An acre foot is the amount of water that would fill one acre to one foot depth. It's about 1,200 cubic meters uh, or around, I believe, uh, quarter million gallons. So these are pretty big numbers. The blue bar to the far right there is the first option, the uh, Carlsbad size plant. The uh, other two bars are showing you, first of all, the annual delivery shortfall of the coastal branch aqueduct. That's how much less water it's providing than uh, was expected by end users. The one in the middle is the annual groundwater overdraft in the central coast, the region very close to Diablo Canyon. The chart below shows our larger options. So now you can see option one is the smallest bar in that graph at 55, uh, 56,000 acre feet per year and the other ones follow over. The two um, uh, magenta bars there are different scales uh, projected for the Delta Conveyance Project, uh, the project that would move water uh, under the uh, California Delta, uh, to give you an idea of how these compare with that project. We believe that the amount of water provided here would be considerably, well, the amount of water would be comparable, but the cost to provide that water would be considerably less than the projected costs of the uh, Delta Conveyance Project. You also see to the left-hand side of that chart, the Central Valley Project's annual shortfall, the State Water Project's annual shortfall, and the San Joaquin Valley's annual overdraft. So the larger plants that we're describing could make a significant dent in these very important numbers about uh, California's water availability. Next slide. Now, quickly here, uh, these are the cost figures that we projected. We looked at uh, industry standard estimators for the costs of desalination plants, accounting for you know, everything that goes into that, uh, piping, membranes, site works, engineering, permitting, and so forth. And uh, we came up with estimated capital cost numbers. Uh, for Carlsbad, uh, we considered that plant using similar methodology, and we believe we're calibrated to Carlsbad. Uh, if you look at the price of electricity, though, the price of electricity we're seeing for Carlsbad is around uh, 13 cents per kilowatt hour. But as John Parsons described, uh, the price of electricity at uh, Diablo Canyon would be significantly less because the tariff structure is very different when you're sitting right next to the plant uh, than when you move it out. Furthermore, we uh, also uh, would take advantage of the existing uh, intakes of the uh, power plant. Our assumption is that if the power plant keeps running, it will have to pay for any necessary upgrades to those intakes. So those are not attributed to the desal plant. So between the two cost savings, energy, uh, electricity cost, and savings and capital investment, the bottom line figures here tell you how the plants we've considered 
uh, compared to uh, the current uh, large desalination plant in California. We're looking at prospective savings in the order of 50% in the cost of water. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the question that remains is the question of intakes. Uh, the California Ocean Plan prescribes very strict requirements uh, for ocean protection, and properly so. Uh, it, and it requires that power plants avoid the entrainment and impingement of marine life when they pull uh, water in. And it has uh, the existing policy requires a reduction in intake flow by 93% uh, to make sure that that is reduced. When that is not feasible, the plant must implement measures that achieve the same result. And these alternative steps are assessed uh, essentially on a case-by-case -case basis. So this uh, regulatory policy was one of the primary technical reasons uh, uh, that led to the shutdown of the Diablo Canyon plant or the proposed shutdown. Uh, the concern was that if uh, the condenser uh, once through cooling were replaced by cooling towers, uh, the cost of the cooling towers would amount to billions and would be prohibitive. Uh, the other proposal that was examined was the one that John mentioned. This was to build a submerged intake gallery beneath the seafloor, essentially using the sand on the ocean floor to filter water that's being taken in. That requires massive excavation of the seabed uh, hundreds of acres would have to be dug up and then replaced uh, to bury the intakes and the costs run to billions. Uh, we have another approach uh, that we'd like to show you here. Uh, and next slide, please. Uh, this approach involves screened intakes. This is an approach that has been approved for the Huntington plant uh, and it's currently being tested at Carlsbad. Huntington Beach is another large proposed desalination plant in California. The way these work is to have one millimeter wide wedge wire screens that run with an intake velocity of less than one half foot per second. Those two combinations prevent uh, marine life from being pulled in and they prevent say fish from being trapped on the surface of a screen by the current that's pulling water in. A major problem of course, is that if you put screens underwater, things grow on them. And the proposal here is to use rotating screens there's existing technology that puts a brush on the screen and turns it on a big drum while water is pulled in. This is existing technology, it is proven technology that's been used and is in use in a number of power plants uh, around the US. It's currently being tested at uh, Carlsbad, in fact. So we believe that this system would meet the requirements of the California Ocean Plan. Uh, and as John mentioned, it would cost significantly less. Next slide. And I will turn this over back to John Parsons to give you a quick uh, insight into the hydrogen issue. Well, I think in the interest of time, we're going to actually skip the next two slides and just go to a conclusion. I think Jacopo already summarized hydrogen and polygeneration. And I, just to close things off, what we'd like to say is uh, this, we think that our study presents a very good case for thinking again about extending the operation of the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant. Of course, there are still a lot of decisions and challenges that have to be met. If you just wanted to keep operating it for the electricity system, you would still have to relicense with the NRC. A lot of work was done in the past, but you would have to do something more to continue it. You would also have to get this new water intake system uh, you know, inspected, certified, and approved, and licensed. And if you wanted to go forward with things like desal and others, there would be other um, approvals you would need. You have to figure out who's going to own the plant and so on. So we can talk about any of those challenges. They are important and significant, uh, but we think it, the, this study presents a very good case for looking at the problem again and making a decision whether it's worthwhile to move forward and address these challenges. So thanks, and we'd look forward to your uh, questions and discussion. Great, well, thank you, um, Professors Buongiorno, Parsons, and uh, Leonard, Leonhard. Um, 
we are going to start in on questions. And um, I guess, uh, Doug, do you have a question queued up or should I get started? You go right ahead, Steve. <laughs> okay. Um, so I guess um, uh, what for Jacobo, what's the by what's the process to obtain the renewal for Diablo and is is there time to do that still before before um, the first uh, shutdown? So in the US, we have at the moment uh, some 90 plus uh, power reactors in operation and all of them except the two units at Diablo Canyon have obtained a 20 year license extension, which is what we are discussing here for Diablo. It has become a fairly routine process for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It takes between 12, 14, 20 months at the latest. Uh, as John Parsons just alluded to, uh, this process that actually started in the late 2000s, I believe 2008, 2009, uh, some uh, equipment, uh, critical equipment that is expected to age was replaced at that time. The uh, license uh, renewal process for Diablo Canyon was interrupted in 2016 or 2018 when uh, there was that multi-party settlement that decided to shut down the plant. So here it's a matter of uh, restarting that licensing process and uh, by our estimate uh, uh, the um, if this process is restarted by the spring of 2023 so effectively a year from today there will be time to to complete it so that uh, the plan can continue to operate mm -hmm. um, as the nrc accepts a license renewal application uh, while that application is being reviewed, the NRC has the authority to allow the plant to continue to operate until until that uh, review is completed. Great. And uh, Dr. Parsons, what what company would be willing to willing and able, I guess, uh, to to either buy or operate? I'm I'm not sure if we know what the proposal is, but is it a qualification question? Is it a is it a willingness or or what? So I think the major question that has to be resolved is, does the political body of California want to use Diablo Canyon? If the state wants it, I think you would find private businesses that would be very happy to own and operate it. In other states that have addressed this question, for example, New York and now Illinois, but let's take New York, Several of their plants were going to possibly close for economic reasons, uh, and uh, and because one owner was kind of getting out of the business. But once the state made its commitment to net zero by 2050, the state also looked at the numbers and said, "We need most of these nuclear plants, or we're going to be taking 10 steps backwards." So the state put forward. A, pro, a new plan for paying the reactors what the value was of their low carbon energy. And when they did that, the company that wanted to get out of the business sold one of the plants to one of a company that is very happy to stay in the business. So I don't think you there would be a problem for a company staying in. And I think it's true that you need qualified operators. PG&E staff have been very qualified operators of this nuclear reactor. And so if, you, if it's a question of ownership, you could transfer the body of the corporate body that's running the plant to new ownership. But nobody will do that unless the state says, we want the plant and we will be a friendly uh, party to that plant continuing to operate. Wow, it is, it's quite... Uh... It seems quite complicated then, but it's it sounds like the state government has to sort of take charge. And and what would a, the prospective buyer see that PG&E doesn't see? I, I, I guess it sounds like the uh, true value of the carbon free electricity is your is your starting point. Right. That, and, so PG&E is a regulated utility. They try to get along with the California Public Utility Commission. And they provide services that the state wants provided. Uh, there was significant political opposition to having a nuclear power plant. And if there's constant political opposition 
to the power plant, PG&E just said, okay, if you don't want us to run it, we're happy to close it. Uh, so that's why I say, if the state realizes how much value there is, you know, the state has made a commitment to decarbonizing and is trying to map out the path that it's going to get there. If the state appreciates the dangers of not having enough power and the costs of really getting to deep decarbonization, this asset has great value for the state. And once the state recognizes that, it's not very hard. I don't actually think the ownership and financing is difficult. It's a political problem. Wow. Uh, Jacobo, how, how does the safety performance at Diablo compare to other, other plants in the US? The safety record at Diablo has been uh, quite good. I think John, John just said that PG&E, in spite of its, uh, you know, maybe somewhat uh, not sparkling reputation in other sectors, has been a good operator for this plant. Um, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, the plant has been in the column one of the NRC evaluation matrix uh, for, for a long time. So it's, uh, uh, there is also a, um, an, an organization called the Institute for Nuclear Power Operation that uh, continuously monitors and rates the nuclear power plants in the US. Those rates are uh, proprietary, confidential. So, but they, but you know, I can tell you that the Diablo Canyon has been has been positive in, in that rating as well. So, if you look at things like uh, um, OSHA reportable uh, events uh, or collective uh, radiation exposure or the workforce and things of that type, Diablo Canyon has has been faring very well. That's, Com That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Professor uh, Leinhard, what are the main cost drivers for desalinated water and, and how how does desal fit into urban water management? Thank you. Uh, the, the, the cost of desalinated water um, by reverse osmosis uh, is roughly 40% uh, electricity cost, uh, maybe 30 to 40% electricity. Uh, the balance is uh, capital and operations, uh, capital being about, uh, about 40% itself. Uh, so the, the cost of desalinated water certainly depends on, on keeping down the energy consumption. On the other hand, today's desalination plants are running uh, within a, you know, a little more than a factor of two of uh, theoretical efficiency. So if we could push them towards second law performance, uh, re fully reversible desalination plant, that's only going to cut the cost of water about 20%. Uh, so if you really want to lower the cost, you also have to get into the engineering and finance issues uh, that are, stand behind these plants. All that said, the plants today are vastly better than they were 20 years ago and certainly vastly better than 40 years ago. Technology is becoming quite mature in that regard. In terms of where desalination fits, uh, inter integrated water management is a really good concept to think about this. Uh, you have the water that you have on hand. First thing to do, don't waste it. Uh, use you know, water efficiency wherever you can get it uh, with water efficient fixtures, with uh, the practices you use around your water consumption. Secondly, reuse water. If you've got the water and it's not that hard to clean up, then purify it and put it back to work. Um, Orange County in California is an international leader in that regard. They treat wastewater. They re-inject it into the aquifer there to uh, prevent saline intrusion and to provide some capacitance and storage, and then they pump it back out and reuse it. The challenge is that both of those approaches deal with the water that you have on hand. And when you don't have water on hand, you need another means of getting water to expand your water supply. Desalination plays a role there. And so it can act as a buffer, uh, uh, essentially a continuously operating source of water supply that is unaffected by drought, that is unaffected by wildfire and other things that damage watersheds. Uh, it is also, um, well, I'll leave it at that, uh, but it, it can act as one part of an overall system. When you go to parts of the world that do not have a lot of water available, the Middle East, for example, Kuwait, uh, then desalination may really be your lifeline. Kuwait gets 100% of its water supply from desalination. Wow, well, that's that's a tells us also why Israel has such uh, some large plants. Now, I'm not sure where this goes, but why 
water people have asked me, why can't the desal plant be distributed and the power you know, sent via the grid? And, and I know this was addressed a little bit in terms of the cost, but, but maybe we don't understand why, why the cost just jumps up, the cost of electricity jumps up so fast. So I don't know who should. I think, I think I'll pass that to John Parsons. Okay. Yes, there are, there are two reasons. Uh, one is the sharing of the intake costs. So you, you already, intake is a very important expenditure because California has very strict rules on uh, you know, the intake and what it can do to marine life. So if you've already got an intake, bring the water in, you can avoid doing a second one. So distributing the desal plants uh, won't um, be able to take advantage of the intake unless you've got other power plants that are doing intake. The second reason mm -hmm. is uh, Diablo is a very efficient source power. The cost is relatively low. And if you co-locate the plant, there are savings in the way the electricity tariff is structured so that you are not, uh, you know, you're paying in a sense for the power directly from the uh, power plant. You still have to pay for backup power. So there's something called a standby tariff. But in our calculations, uh, even though you're paying a standby tariff, you save money from uh, the co-location. And at the, so after the 20, max 20 year renewal period, you, you still have a desal plant, but you're presumably shutting down. So do we need a new, new next gen nuclear facility? Is that the, is that the logical conclusion or, or what? Let, let, let me maybe, maybe start to take to answer that question. Uh, it, it, it is entirely possible that uh, you could go for a further extension to 40 years. In fact, we've seen a couple of plants that have done that, although now the, the, that question is being reopened by the NRC. Um, there, are, there are essentially two structures within a nuclear power plant that are considered uneconomic to replace. One is the reactor pressure vessel that I mentioned earlier. The other one is the containment structure. As long as those two have not aged appreciably, uh, you can continue to replace other equipment within the plant and, and do further license extension. So in principle, it would be possible for Diablo to continue. But suppose Diablo disappears, then it's going to be a question 20 years from now or 20 plus years from now to decide which alternative energy source is going to be used by that desalination plant. And that could entail a new nuclear power plant on site, or it could be uh, now drawing generic electricity from the grid. And who knows exactly what the grid will look like by then. It might be entirely decarbonized or it might be other nuclear mm -hmm. power plants distributed. Uh, but some of the advantages that we mentioned uh, earlier that John just mentioned would probably not be there, for example, the sharing tech. Well, I'll, I'll add another possibility and, you know, 20, 20 years or so, perhaps uh, our colleagues at MIT will have come through with uh, very high performance and expensive batteries. Uh, there's a lot of work on that. And then perhaps there'll be offshore wind there that can then go into the batteries and provide you uh, stable base load power. Um, I'm an optimist. Uh, <laughs> so smart. <laughs> so the, one of the really creative um, parts about this is converting, and Jacobo touched on this several times, converting the nuclear plant to dispatchable power because you're, I presume, turning the water, the desal up and down. And so I, I guess uh, Dr. Parsons, uh, or if you're the right one, can you talk about the dynamics of that, making it dispatchable and swinging between generation and desal? Sure. Well, you can think of it as dispatchable. Another way to think about it, and this happens in lots of states and in California too, when you have emergencies, there are industrial consumers who sometimes cut their use and release their normal consumption of power back to the grid. So for example, this desal plant, we looked into the possibility of doing what would be called a hot shutdown, stopping the production of water from the desal plant Evidently, my colleague, uh, Professor Leonhardt tells us, you still have to uh, spend a little bit of electricity, a good bit, keeping the plant uh, in uh, performance so that 
uh, the membranes uh, still work when you turn it back on. Uh, so there, you would you don't want to do that very often. There's a high cost, but you can do it in emergencies like August 2020. Hydrogen is a different thing. Hydrogen production, it's much easier to turn on and off. So you could much more easily use the hydrogen system uh, when the electricity is, is very needed on the grid, turn off hydrogen production. When the electricity is not so needed on the grid because it's the middle of the day and solar is plentiful, you turn back on your hydrogen system. So it's different for the different uses. And, I, and I'll add on the case of the desalination plant. Uh, I was speaking to the leader of one of the uh, uh, desalination companies in Israel, uh, who was describing to me that one of their large plants is, is following tariffs. And so they're ramping up productions when the electricity tariff drops. He told me they could ramp it up uh, 50 megawatts in about five minutes. Uh, so there, some, some degree of load following is possible in those plants. Well, that's that's uh, fantastic. So, who, it, it's one of the key thoughts was the state has to want to do this to make it happen. So, what? How do we get to the state? Um, who who would be the proponents that would push for this? Would the water people push? Would the energy people? Would it? Um, you know, I, what's the political reality that you would think would make sense? And again, I'm not sure who should take that. <laughs> I'm so happy I'm a professor. <laughs> I think I a know. lot of different advocates need to think about it. I mean, the no. people who want to advocate decarbonization need to see the challenges of achieving decarbonization. And, uh, you know, both the cost is a challenge and the land use is a challenge. And it's just, if, if you really confront those challenges, keeping this is valuable. And so you should want to go and work with your allies to make it happen. I think that I was excited when Jacopo mentioned this idea to me because desalinization puts a different spin on the problem. Everybody's debated Diablo in the past, but here you have a need of water in the middle of these droughts and with the, uh, problems facing the different communities overdrafting their uh, reservoirs. So I just think people need to think differently and approach uh, the, the problems differently and hopefully see the uh, value of this asset anew. I, I want to mention a couple of extra um, uh, elements that I think haven't come up. The economic uh, footprint of the plant is also pretty high at the local level. Uh, it employs over a thousand uh, workers there. Those are well-paid jobs, well above average, even in that county. Uh, so there is certainly uh, local stakeholders that, that are likely to support a license extension there. Uh, it pays also good local taxes. Um, business associations are interested in seeing uh, stability of their energy supply and not just stability of the energy, but also stability of the, of the prices. Uh, based on analysis that we just shown, should be interested in seeing this asset remaining on the uh, remaining on the grid. So I think I think there is a, a a potential coalition here of stakeholders in California that that could push this. But I think as as John and others have been saying all along, uh, it, it ultimately is the state has to decide. The political body of the state has to decide that this is a facility that has value and 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 allow that conversation to unfold and. And the different stakeholders come forth and come up with a business plan that makes sense. And, and the state is a, a representative democracy. All voices should be heard. And unfortunately, sometimes in these conversations, only the loudest voices get the airtime. Uh, there are a lot of good people out there who can look at these issues and perhaps do it from multiple perspectives. Maybe if those voices are heard, different decisions will get made. Yeah, it would be interesting to get the water the water voices behind this because right now I think they're not they're not uh, engaged but the, you know there there's a desire to build more dams and primarily but would would we need to build more pipelines also is this does this have a pipeline straight to the um, 
straight to the canals or could we add more pipelines to places where there was high water demand? If you're referring to the desalination plant at Diablo yes. Canyon. So we did scope a, de, uh, a pipeline uh, running inland to uh, basically to the existing California aqueducts. And uh, that pipeline adds a few cents per cubic meter to the cost of water. Uh, the pathway seems reasonably straightforward without uh, you know, a lot of destruction en route. Uh, so we, we think that's certainly doable. Um, the reservoirs, you know, of course, also need distribution, and they're often much farther from the end user. Um, desalination broadly, setting aside the nuclear plant, generally can be co-located with the community it serves. Okay, well, um, let's see. I, I think we're at 6.30 or just passing it, so I, I think we should um, thank um, professors um, uh, Jacobo and uh, Parsons and um, uh, Leinhard to for the uh, work and uh, and this presentation and Doug, um, if you want to come back on and give us any words of wisdom. Okay, I'm back. So uh, no, this is a really really great presentation, you guys, and we really appreciate you having done it. Um, I think this is a really big deal for this state. And, and, you know, maybe it's a little bit esoteric for the average person to understand what the opportunity is here, but maybe in some small way, we've been able tonight to uh, get it out to more people to see some potential here that, that, that know the right people to be able to influence, to take another look. Uh, at any rate, uh, we just appreciate the, the thoroughness in which you've done the analysis and the proposals and um, frankly, you know, I, I kind of see this, this poly generation thing or multi-purpose application as just a really exciting possibility. And uh, it's my hope that we'll be able to turn this situation around and, and re retain this tremendous asset that we have. So with that, uh, I want to just thank you all again for your participation and uh, bringing this to us. I'll, I'll, I'll say that we had well over 100 viewers today. And uh, that's a very good size audience in these days. So uh, we thank all of you who attended and, and appreciate your support of our program. Okay, so now I'd like to just announce our next event. Um, it's gonna be on long duration energy storage. And you know, it kind of relates to what we've been talking about today because the alternative to what was being talked about in terms of keeping uh, nuclear energy online is to come up with storage to back up an increasing amount of renewables like solar and wind uh, because they don't, as you know, the sun doesn't shine all day long and neither does the wind blow. Um, so we got two people who are really knowledgeable in this area, Julia Suter, who uh, is really uh, leading a nonprofit organization that's been focusing on this for many years and is an advisor to the state. And Dr. Noel uh, Bakhtian, who is at the um, Lawrence uh, Berkeley uh, National Laboratory and is very familiar with the Department of Energy programs that are being conducted in this area. So it's a pretty exciting uh, event. Um, and it's, it's uh, on Wednesday, the 20th of April, so five weeks from now. And we hope that many of you who are on tonight can also see this, this uh, really great uh, presentation we're gonna bring. Uh, with that, I wanna thank again, the participants and also our audience for uh, hanging in for a long time and showing your great interest I'm sorry we couldn't answer all the questions. Uh, there was one that um, I can't answer, I think, is can we get a copy of the presentation? Well, it'll be up to these gentlemen to let us know and we can forward it to anybody who requests it from the club. But all of these virtual events that we run on are, are recorded and they're posted on YouTube. So you can, all, all you have to do is put in the name of the event to YouTube and this will come up uh, and that will, allow you to see the slides over and over again. And by the way, there is a pretty interesting trick. When you do that, is just use your um, um, uh, snipping tool <laughs> if you want to preserve a couple of those slides. So uh, so anyway, I think that's it for this evening. Um, we'll turn you all loose to do whatever it is. Dinner probably out here on the West Coast, and you gentlemen will probably want to 
go back and relax and have a cocktail. So, yeah. Doc, thanks for having us, day. and uh, we'll definitely share the slides. They don't have to do the YouTube trick. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. So long. Bye. Thanks.